Repent. The kingdom is at hand. God's destruction is coming upon the world because of our sin. Repent. It's time to repent. God is going to bring an end to this world and all of the sin that surrounds us, the sin in our lives. It's time to repent. Remember that if we don't repent, God will come and remove the lampstand from the churches. It's time to repent because Jesus is coming soon. For two or three generations, some of you have heard the preaching of evangelists and preachers, revivalists, pastors, to repent and get your life right with God and to share Jesus Christ with others. But many come to church each week and their lives are unchanged. Taylor sort of spoke for that a few moments ago. The lives of some people in the church are no different from those outside the church. That's a sad commentary on our time and on Christianity. Because I believe the power of God is stronger than that if we would rely upon Him. And He is within us if we have received Jesus Christ as Lord. The pastor says, share Jesus with people. And we roll our eyes and say, there He goes again. The pastor says, give offerings to the church so the church can grow. And we roll our eyes and say, there he goes again. The pastor says, repent. Jesus is coming soon. We do nothing. Well, we may roll our eyes and say, there he goes again. How do you think the people in Noah's day reacted to his message? We have... Pastors, preachers, revivalists standing on street corners these days and on television and we flip through, we don't listen to them, we don't pay attention to them. We think they're crazy. We have a stereotype about them. And here it is. It's not a pleasant stereotype. They're screaming in our faces and we don't want to hear it. Even we as Christians often get into that same attitude, the same attitude as the world, those who are not Christians. So the question is, are we living our lives in such a way that just our lives are attractive to other people so that they want to come? They may even come and ask you, what is the reason for the hope that is within you? And when you invite them to church, when you tell them your testimony, and you invite them to church, then they come. I realize one of the problems is we're kind of, we've made sharing Christ an artificial kind of add-on. Well, I've got to do it because it's duty. I've got to do it because the preacher tells me I should. But the point is, if, if our life, if Christ within us and our lives become a natural outgrowth of God's grace within us, then people, I think, even in our age, even in our time, I think people are going to want to know the reason why you have joy within you. We think of Noah as the one who built the ark for all the animals to survive the great flood, and he did. When Noah was not engineering that great ship, what was he doing? The Bible tells us, and this is part of the story that we don't hear very much, but the Bible tells us that when he wasn't building the boat, he was preaching to the people who needed God. He was warning them of the coming destruction by water. They also grew weary of his message to repent. And if my recollection of the Bible served me right, 
that when Noah said the rain is coming, they also likely rolled their eyes and said, uh, the old windbag, there he goes again. Not much different than today. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says this, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. I don't know if you've seen the movie. I haven't. This is not a sermon about the movie. But I think it is timely for us to know the real story of Noah. What happened? Why did God bring the great flood? And why is it relevant to our world today? Is it important? Here's a hard lesson for us today as Christians in the 21st century. I want you to get this. Today, many of the people in the church act more like the people outside of Noah's ark who were destroyed. That should open our eyes, shouldn't it? I want you to think about that. I think it's on the next slide here. Today, many of the people inside the church act more like the people outside of Noah's Ark who were destroyed. What do I mean by that? Many in the church repented, but we've never changed. And I have to wonder, do we really understand what the word repentance means? What does it mean when we come forward and we give the pastor our hand and we say, I, I want to be baptized. I want to receive Jesus. Do we really understand what is going on and what happens and what should happen after that? The word repentance means to make a U-turn in your life. You're going in one direction. You realize that you're a sinner. You, re you realize that you need forgiveness. You need to get your life right. And so you make a U-turn, and you turn to God. You receive Jesus Christ as Lord in your life, and the Holy Spirit comes into your life, Jesus within you, and begins to teach you. Do this, don't do that. We begin to grow as Christians. But unfortunately, I'm afraid that many, many of us who seemingly make a decision for Christ, we're not repenting. We're not changing. Janice and I had a discussion even this morning about, it wasn't about the sermon. It was about something else. And As a Baptist Christian, I believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. I believe in eternal security of the believer. But I'm concerned that many Christians, many Baptists today, have come to this point of saying, well, I made a decision for Christ, I'm saved, it doesn't matter what I do. And I agree, we're not saved by what we do, we, we're saved by what? Grace. We're saved by grace through faith, plus nothing else. But if we are saved by grace through faith, then shouldn't our lives show a testimony that God has changed us and is continually changing us? No, I don't want to go back under the law. I don't want to be legalistic about holiness and righteousness and so forth. We don't do what is right because we want to to earn God's grace and forgiveness, but instead, because we have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we want to live a holy life. 
there any agreement on that? It's important. Many in the church don't appear to love sinners. If we don't love the people outside the church, then what makes us any different from those who were outside the ark? We might as well be outside the ark. Because Jesus wants us to love God and to love other people. And he doesn't say only love Christians. He says love others. How do we love others? The way God has loved you. That's how we're supposed to do that. A lot of times, people in the church, we don't even love other people in the church, much less people who are outside the church. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 5. I'm going to begin with verse 32. It's the last verse in the chapter. But it gives us a little insight, a little factoid, if you will about Noah. Notice how old he was at this point in his life. And Noah was 500 years old and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So how old was he? 500 years old. Now I don't know if it was right at that point that God came to him and said, I want you to build the ark. We know it was sometime after that point because in chapter 6, verse 1, we go right into the rest of the story. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. For he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all the flesh that corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Now he goes on and gives him the rest of the instructions, fairly detailed instructions on building the ark. We see at least four things in this introduction, in these passages. First of all, if Noah was 500 years old, looking at verse 5, chapter 5, verse 32. If Noah was 500 years old when God told him to build the ark and 600 years old when the flood came, if you look at Genesis 7, 11, 
that it's reasonable to assume that the construction of the ark took place during that 100-year period. Imagine staying focused on working on this mighty project for 100 years. And presumably, it was Tim and his sons. I guess he could have hired some people uh, who would not ever be on that ark to help out. But when they ask him, what is the reason for building this ark? And he tells them, because God is going to bring a great flood. And you have to remember something. It's never rained on the earth at that point in time. If you read the story about the Garden of Eden, you understand that the plants were watered by a mist that would come up every day from the earth, kind of like a fog. And so it had never rained at this point. So when Noah was not working on the ark, he was preaching. And when he wasn't preaching, he was working on the ark. The second point that I would make is that Satan, as usual, attempts to hijack God's plan. He'll do that in your personal life also. He does it in the life of a church. And he does it with all of humanity as he does in this passage. Satan attempts to hijack God's plan to save humanity. Many Bible scholars believe that the fallen angels procreated with women and offspring were giants and mighty men, sort of superhuman. Now, I don't know if that's the case or not. I understand all the arguments for and against. But I do know that Satan certainly tried to attempt to forestall God's work of grace through Noah's family. There's another interesting little tidbit here in this introduction, and that is that God further limits mankind's lifespan to 120 years. Now when I say further limits, what I'm recognizing is that when Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden, where they were supposed to live forever, then God limited their lifespan. Now, they still lived a long time. I mean, the grandfather, do you know the grandfather of Noah? His name was Methuselah. And he lived longer than any other human being on record on the earth. He was 900-something years old. So we don't live that long anymore. I know some of you wish we could, as long as we don't get arthritis <laughs> and some of those other problems that we get when, as we age. But God limited the lifespan of mankind to about 120 years. I don't know anybody that's that old. I met somebody last week at another church where I preached. He was 98 years old, still drives his car. Still goes to church every Sunday. <clears throat> now why did God bring the great flood? There's one word we can sum it up with. Anybody know the word? It's sin. Now God gives us a little more detail in his word about this. He says the thoughts and the intents of mankind were all evil. Except for Noah and presumably his family. But everybody else, they didn't recognize God. They didn't worship God. But Noah did. Now there's a couple points that I want to make as we go into the message. And, and the first major point is this. Noah was saved by grace through his relationship with God. And so we understand as New Testament believers that we're saved by grace through faith. But that's New Testament. That's after the cross of Jesus, right? So how were people saved in the Old Testament, before Jesus? Same thing. They were saved by grace through faith. We make a mistake thinking that they were saved by works. 
They weren't. They were saved by faith. They were saved by God's grace through faith. It was exhibited through obedience, yes, but that's not because of works. But notice Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, the end of the verse, it has four words there. That I wish, I would wish that this would be God's opinion of every one of us, or that it would be a fact for every one of us. Noah walked with God. That's an incredible testimony, isn't it? Other people who know you, do you think that they would say that Tom walks with God? Do you think that they would say that Sarah walks with God? And take your name and put it there and say, do you think, God, that other people believe that you walk with God? I'm a firm believer and I want to encourage you that if you live a life that is magnetic for other people, if you live a life of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, your life will be a magnet because people will see that you walk with God and they're going to want that too for their lives. Now, that doesn't mean to be arrogant or holier than thou or anything like that because once we cross that line, we're going to repel people. And I think we do. I think we have a tendency sometimes to repel people instead of attract people. But if we truly walk with God in all humility, I believe we will attract other people to our faith. So if you want to hear God's will for your life and your family, then you need to walk with God. If you want to hear God's will for your family, life and your family, then maintain your personal integrity. We call that holiness. Second point. Noah was saved by grace and he applied his faith by his obedience. He obeyed God. The ark is a symbol of Noah's faith and obedience. I mean, he spent all of this time building this ark. To me, you know, God did a lot of miraculous things, but he tells Noah to build this giant ship that's, I don't know, about the size of maybe the USS Nimitz or something like that. And he builds it out of wood. I think it's an, a, a, an amazing engineering feat to build a ship that is that sturdy and that big at the same time in prehistoric times. He didn't have the tools that we have today. But it's a symbol of his faith and obedience. What if Noah had only built half of the ark and then said, I quit? Well, we wouldn't be talking about it today. There probably wouldn't be a movie about it. I want, I want to give you a point. Partial obedience is disobedience. There's no other way to look at it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. And you have to remember, Hebrews chapter 11 is what we call the hall of faith. It is where the writer records the faith down through the ages of great historical believers, followers of God. And Noah is there. In verse 7, the Bible says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Noah built the ark. He obeyed God. I like what Pastor Charles Stanley says on this point. 
If you see him on TV and look at his, listen to his messages, you'll hear him say this often. He says this, obey God and leave the results to him. He'll take care of it. And I agree. Obey God and leave the results to him. He'll take care of you and he'll take care of the issues and the problems. I'm amazed in my own life. Sometimes I get all concerned and upset about something and before I get to the reckoning of whatever that issue is, God takes care of it. It sort of resolves itself because God takes care of it. Because I have been obedient to God about that particular issue. The ark is a symbol of salvation. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 is a place where Jesus mentions Noah by name. Now I know there's a lot of uh, people, scholars, that want to say, they will say that, that Adam and Eve were mythical people, they weren't really individual people. They will say that Noah didn't really live, that it's just a story book kind of thing out of the Bible, which is mythical. That's what they say. I say the Bible is God's Word. And so if Jesus mentioned Noah, then that confirms to me, that which I already knew, that Noah was a real person. And Jesus says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day of Noah, when he entered the ark. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, and one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is come, is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming to it at an hour you do not expect. Remember the, the bullhorn? Jesus is coming soon. Repent. I don't know when he's coming. I don't know the day or the hour. But we need to get ready, and we don't need to wait. And this is real. And this is in our time. There's not going to be the, an ark, not a wooden ark. But let me tell you who is the ark in the coming destruction of the world, if you will. Jesus is the ark. The biblical writers in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle and others, recognized, and they used this term, in Christ. Paul said a number of times, receive Jesus and you will be in Christ. And Christ represents, in our time, Christ represents the ark. Remember in Noah's time, if you weren't in the ark, then you die. And at the end of this age, if you're not in Christ, you'll be destroyed. It's a parallel in the Bible. So the ark is a symbol of salvation. It's a symbol of faith and baptism. Look at this. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient. When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a baptism... Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. And so what is he saying? He's describing baptism as passing through the flood into Christ, the ark, and his protection. There's something else that's in this passage. Noah was saved by grace through sacrifices that pointed to Jesus' sacrifice. 